morning, Matt. Good morning. Great to be here. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, Mr. Gilstrap. Good morning. And co-hosting and guesting the mogul. Then we get Michael Hornby. Good morning. We're obviously at the bottom of the barrel for content on this show. How did height make the open? That just... I've owned the station for eight years, and I haven't made the open yet. I'm very disappointed in you, Rob. Oh. <laughs> can, can we sit down now, or do we have to keep standing while, while you're in the room? Is that... <laughs> I, I got a, an hour to go now. My spirits are crushed. Yeah. The guy who no, the I just, I, you, know, you know I love height. I, uh, he asked a great question there, man. He, he is did. the he is the badger, the height. His, his interviewing skills have gotten much much better over the years. He's, he's a good he's guy. He's becoming very good. He doesn't scream as much anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does. Just not as on. Not he on still screams, mic. just not on mic. It's just yeah. the indoor yeah. voice scream. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, by the way, I had uh, for dinner yesterday wedding Italian wedding soup as crafted and created by Mike's wife Crescia, mm. who every day that goes by when she's not running a restaurant is humanity being cheated of what she can create <laughs> and she made some baked ziti t- last night too so, was, so you brought some in i presume i did not sorry <sighs> you made me come in early so usually i I, you know, <laughs> I could sit and watch the show and go i should bring in rob some uh ziti, you should, depending you should on how it. you behave <laughs> <laughs> and, and and this was their first attempt at italian wedding soup yes too. Uh, i've never had it it oh, was it's amazing unbelievable um very very good it was My son uh, liked it My daughter liked it yeah, and then the banana bread she made with it, too. And she even sent me like a little thing of grated Parmesan cheese to sprinkle in there, too. I have to be very careful about how much I eat at home. Yeah. You should weigh 400 pounds. I should, I should really weigh 400 should. For those of us who are not familiar with Italian wedding soup, what what is it? Is it a chicken-based? or It's got a, like meat, it's a beef and pork meatball in it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got some veggies in it. But they're tiny it. meatballs. They're, they're, yeah, they're little ones. So um, it was just delicious. Some noodles. There's some garlic mm-hmm. in there. It's it is good. good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't have to go to an Italian wedding to get it, although that does help. But I'm guessing that's where it started. Got to be. Yeah, along with the cookie table. <laughs> yeah, you know, is, Jim, she, is she is she Italian? Jimmy? Your wife Italian? Yeah, My, she's she, she she's, she's got Italian, Italian, Mexican, Russian. I mean, she's got a she's got boiling a good, pot of everything. Yeah, good framework bit, for, yeah. for being able to cook. So her mom was fully Italian, and her grandmother was 100 percent Italian, didn't speak English. So. FBI, full blooded Italian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we call it, at least, anyway. <laughs> Jimmy Willis is our guest here, and he is the delegate from the third delegate district in the Northern Panhandle. So, Jimmy, you have to know what a cookie table at a wedding is, right, in the Northern Panhandle? Yeah, I've, I've had a few. Yeah, see? You get, you get up near Pittsburgh, you get the cookie table when you go to a wedding. And you get a lot of Italian wedding soup, too. The cookie table is amazing because it's, just, it's a table filled of cookies. Now, you don't go to the supermarket and buy Chips Ahoy. These are, these are baked by people involved with the wedding and everyone brings so many of them and it's a bunch of different home baked cookies it's amazing stuff now is the money bag that's with yeah. the, is that is is that all italian weddings or is that only it's, it's special a, it's italian it's been weddings? at every uh, italian wedding that i've been to and okay. it, mostly almost every pittsburgh wedding i've been to it's been in there too so jimmy i, I was telling them uh, that i invited you on today and, and all three of these guys instantly said oh my cousin Vinny, do, do you get that a lot? <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I totally didn't get it, but because I don't remember Jimmy movies Willis like that. Is the guy that got killed? He's never on screen. He got killed at the sack of suds at the beginning of My Cousin Vinny. It's what got Ralph <laughs> Macchio. When, did, when did that movie come out? 1990. I shot the guy. <laughs> and, and I shot the guy. I shot the guy. And all three it. of you said the same thing. Yeah. But I asked you who the first person was that was on the show today, and you looked with a blank <laughs> stare. But you can remember something like that from 30 years ago. Yeah, Jimmy Willis. <laughs> but this morning only happened once. I've seen my cousin Vinny, you know, <laughs> a thousand, thousand times. times right. yeah. uh, Jimmy, let's talk about the Northern Panhandle and Form Energy, which, when that was being voted on and eventually passed, seemed to be a very divisive issue amongst uh, the uh, House of Delegates, and it, it got a few people labeled as rhinos who went along with this here. Uh, Jimmy, I presume since this is in your backyard that you were in full support of it? Yeah, 100% support. Yeah, I, th- I think I remember having you on the program as this was going through, and Mike tells us you recently were able to meet with some folks up there and uh, and, and learn a bit more about what Form Energy is going to be doing. Yeah, so I've, I've gotten to talk to some of the uh, city councilmen up there. I haven't, I haven't got to be on site, but uh, just driving by the site. It is uh, coming up pretty fast. Uh, they're making great progress. 
Um, it, the production started, or the construction started in about the middle of this year, and the expectation is they'll start production in the middle to late part of next year. Why do you think there was so much controversy over the form energy vote? Um, you know, I, personally, I thought it was a it was a good idea. Uh, I would have to defer defer that to to some of the delegates who were in the opposition of it. Um, but for, to me, it was it was a good opportunity. Now that some of the things that got brought up were you know people who were investors um, and things like that, which a lot of it was disproven. Um, and some of it was shown as just min- minimal. I know the biggest one. Do we still have you, Jimmy? Bill Gates' own company, which is just simply simply untrue. You know, he was a investor through an investor of a small amount of money in uh, Bill's Bill's terms. Um, the, and just calling him the owner is a little bit of a stretch. You know, being an investor through an investor would be like calling him the owner in that situation would be like saying, I own the state of West Virginia because I pay taxes and then my taxes fund the state. Um, so it was minimal, but that that was one of the biggest ones I've heard and still seen here. Tell me about the impact this will make in the northern panhandle. Oh, this 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 is going to be huge up here. So it's uh, 750 jobs guaranteed. That's, that's the deal that they made with the state. And um, actually there was a, there was an, um, a piece in the local news last night about the, the form CFO was in town for a uh, Weirton Rotary Club meeting, and they, they interviewed a guy, and I think he summed it up pretty good in what the consensus up here is of, you know, he, his grandkids aren't going to have to leave now. Um, and it's bringing hope back into the area. You know, this is just this is just the start. This is uh, 55 acres of a 1,200-acre spot of land that we can bring anything we want to onto. So this is just definitely the opening act. Jimmy Willis, our guest here, is a delegate in the third delegate district here. We're talking about uh, Form Energy. And uh, how many people at the end, when this is at full capacity, do you anticipate that will be there? Um, you know, I'm not too sure what the full will be. I know it's 750 guaranteed, but, I mean, it, as, as everyone who's in business knows, if, if it's going great in 750 and you're doing great and you can expand, obviously, you, you know, you're going to expand more. But... The, the guarantee is 750, so that I mean that's that's huge on its own back back home, um, and if, if it brings more, we'll be very happy to ha- happy to see more jobs. Now there are many cynical people out there, Jimmy, the kind where you say, "Oh, it's going to be a sunny day," and their first thought is, "We're all going to die of skin cancer." And and some of them listen to the show and comment on Facebook, and one of those comments was, "Well, yeah, well, you're just going to be doing job fairs in Ohio and Pennsylvania." for these West Virginia uh, tax dollars we forked over to bring in Form Energy. What do you say to that? Um, you know, it, it, it kind of got the same thing going on up here that, that you guys have have going on over in the eastern panhandle of, yeah, we can't guarantee that every job is going to be a, a West Virginia citizen, but we can guarantee that every job will, you know, pay the state payroll tax. You know, every job will, you know, buy buy their their snacks, their, their cigarettes, their beer on the way home from work or eat, eat at a restaurant here, here in downtown Weirton. Um, after work or grab breakfast before work. So it's, even if they're from Ohio or Pennsylvania, it's, it's not like there's going to be zero economic impact in the in, in with that job. John Gilstrap. I'm curious, you're, you live near the area, you live in that area. So are you seeing an increase in property values and such attendant to the new construction? Uh, you know, I really haven't looked at, 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 at the housing market up, up in that area. I know that... Um, there are people who are definitely interested in moving in. Um, we just had a, actually a new bridge opened up here, too, so that's going to open up some more job opportunities um, for people to come over uh, for some of those people. But uh, not yet. I would say not yet. You know, obviously, we're still in the very early stages. Um, but by mid to late next year, when 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 they're starting to hire in mass uh, for a lot of these jobs, I, I could see that happening. Yeah, I, I, I'm a relatively new transplant to West Virginia, and um, having come from a business where NIMBY, not in my backyard, is is a drumbeat, I'm amused that the toxic Rockwell signs are still all over the eastern panhandle. And is is this a West Virginia thing that resists the the new development, or is that is just human nature, do you think? I, I think some of it's human nature. You know, we're, we're a state that, that that's known been known historically for 
you know, the coal mines, the steel mills. And, and unfortunately, those jobs that aren't, there's not as many of those jobs left in the state of West Virginia. And I think having to see new companies come in, it, it is a little bit of a, almost a culture shock to some people um, to see something new because it's right on the old steel mill site in Weirton. So, it, you know, it's a different different kind of company on, on the steel mill site that, that quite, quite literally built that town and grew that town and at one point employed 13,000 people. Um, so it is a little bit different. I don't. I, I think some of the concern um, will will go away once once we see the doors open uh, and business start and people, you know, friends, family start getting hired. I think I think some of the concerns will definitely go away quickly. Plus, I would think there's going to be a lot of revitalization of the area that that imploded after the steel mill left, and now we have all of this real estate opportunity for new housing that's arguably within walking distance or certainly a short drive of the plant. I'm having a hard time seeing the downside to any of this. Yeah, I mean, that that was that was uh, my thoughts as well. I know that when we were going through this in the House, I was talking to Secretary Carmichael about it, and I had the same sentiments he did. You know, we, we thought this would be a slam dunk um, once it was announced. But obviously people had their had their concerns, and, and uh, I don't want to speculate why anyone had their specific concerns but it, it's going to be huge i mean there's just no way to no way to ignore that it, it's going to be huge for the area and like i said i think this is just the opening act of a revitalization and you've seen some of it you know people trying to move in and i, I mean there's going to be businesses that open up in the next few years trying to you know take advantage of 750 more people working in downtown weirton every day and it's just going to be tremendous to see for the entire for the entire area too. Plus, you got the healthcare workers to take care of the workers' kids, and then you've you've got the bodega that's going to feed them, and you've got the you know it's just it's, it's a it's a huge revi- revitalization opportunity. I mean, you just have to look at the Eastern Panhandle and, and look at what you know the Macy's, Procter and Gamble, Clorox, what they've done. When one comes, the rest will follow. And you look at housing prices here in the Eastern Panhandle based. 10 years ago compared to now, a lot of us are, are, are reaping the rewards of that right now. Matt Harvey. Hey, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning, D- Delegate Willis. Uh, good morning. How are the people, your constituents that you represent, what's their what's their opinion? That's the, the, the most important thing for you, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I had... Um, I had some people come a little cautiously optimistic to to, to ask me some questions because obviously the, the the fallout of everything that happened in Charleston around this made made the news you know around the state and definitely back home because we were the ones who were going to reap the rewards of, of that bill and um, so there was some concern but when I explained some of the things and kind of told them that you know this this isn't the true or this is being stretched a little bit. Uh, the, the cautious went out and it was just straight it was just optimism you know everyone's excited because. You know, I don't represent I don't represent Weirton, but my district line ends 10, 15 minutes from the site. You know, we're gonna people from my district are gonna get jobs from this, and then the downstream effect of it. You know, maybe someone opens a restaurant up in there, and maybe when the next company, if they don't get hired here, maybe the next company that comes, they take a job there, and this, this is just gonna just explode the area. Do you know what the projected economic impact is going to be for this corporation? Or for this project, um, excuse me. Yeah, we we got the numbers when we were down in Charleston. I don't have them with me, unfortunately. I left them in my office. Um, I think it's I uh, two and a half billion dollars um, economic impact within a, a, a few few years. There, there, there it is. Was, Thank you. It's yeah. a lot of money. That's a lot of money for for an area that is impoverished and uh, has a problem with jobs and, and, and bringing people I, in. I think I, uh, people that haven't been over there i don't think they understand the the blight yeah. that, that is that's affected that area um so it, is it the tesla's district that it's actually in jimmy yeah 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 when you talk to Del- delegate to Z- 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 uh, it, it, it was he was truly passionate and, and when i first heard about this part i was the same i wasn't jimmy and and, and Mark would come up and talk to me and, and when i talked to him and i was in his district the passion and the he was basically pleading for for this to happen for his district. It was that going to affect him that much? So there was a yeah, and I mean, I, I don't want to I don't want to steal Mark's story, but it was it was so awesome to see him be able to vote for this and get get this project here. Um, you know that that specific spot on the old steel mill site is where his his grandfather, who was a first generation American, 
worked and then that and then his his father was a um became a, a, a head of the steel mill and especially that that part of the steel mill he was he was running it and now all these years later after the mill closed down he was able to to fight and bring bring jobs to that to that part of the steel mill which was just an awesome awesome story all the way around there's a question about whether if uh, you lived in Pennsylvania and worked in West Virginia at this mill, if you paid state income tax in West Virginia, the answer to that is no. There's reciprocity agreements between the states. You do not, unless you live in the state of West Virginia, you but don't if, pay But if you tax. look at the Eastern Pan and you look at the, the people coming in to work <clears throat> here, most of our folks are still driving outside to, to work. So they're working in D.C. Mm-hmm. or Virginia. But with P&G, they've actually brought people in. So nobody's going to live out of state and commute into West Virginia. You, you're generally going to go, hey, I can get a house in West Virginia way cheaper than I can anywhere else. Certainly. I'm going to go there, and we've got lower taxes, too. So, Well, and the fact of the matter is you, you're going to pay a West Virginia sales tax when you buy products here. You're going to pay a gasoline tax when you buy your gasoline here. And at some point along the way, you're going to need to get gasoline when you're in West Virginia. Yep. So. Uh, those things all work out, and when you spend money here, you employ people, as John said, the the shop that uh, sells sandwiches or whatever, because other places well, are going to open up around this mill. Well, you look at just the construction site. I think Colin had some pictures up there. There's got to be a couple of hundred folks working on that right now. Um, there's businesses that are providing supplies to, to that site right now. There's West Virginia businesses that are making profit off the site. Um, so I, I think yeah, even in the building— yeah, if I can add to that too, I, Form definitely deserves a, uh, a shout out for this too. I went to one of their their first events they had, and they had a booth that was specific for people who had small businesses um, who were interested in becoming a partner with them through the build, whether it's product or you know paving parking lots, things like that. So they were looking for local small businesses to be partners through this as well. So I mean, it wasn't like they they brought companies with them from from where they were to do this. They're they're trying to be good members of the community they're trying to get small businesses involved with with this entire process and it's just, it's just been tremendous and i mean like you said there's already people working there um it, it's it's been key and it's it's just bringing in the small businesses to work with you just brings more downstream you know revenue to the state and to, to local companies to continue to help this area grow before they even produce a product Jimmy, I want to switch gears on us here away from Form Energy and talk about one of the committees that uh, you are a part of, which is uh, fire departments and emergency medical services. I know Mike has done a lot of research into this in regards to the state and fire departments and whether we'll get meaningful legislation out of this coming up in January at the next session. Are any of these items being addressed again in either of the two interims between now and the end of the year, Jimmy or Mike? Um, you know, I can't speak on that particularly. I'm not on the interim committee for fire departments. I'm on the regular session mm-hmm. um, one. That I, but I know that w- what I can say is during the special session that that, that money we, we got appropriated to the fire departments um, has become, the way we did it, it has, in my understanding, become a line item in the budget. So it's, it's going to have to be addressed one way or another, whether we do it or don't, because it, it is in the state budget now. And for growth counties, it, it gave us some freedom to use those funds for paid firefighters. And I think that's the that's the next battle that we're going to have is, is trying to fund paid firefighters because, let's be honest, the volunteer fire departments, they do a great job, but they are dwindling in, in the amount of actual volunteers. It, it's, it's a different way of life these days. So for, for growth counties, we need a way to fund actual paid firefighters well, so that we if- can... If people could work closer to home, yeah, that would help out mm-hmm. with the volunteer yeah. fire Absolutely. fighters. Yeah, you have tough to volunteer when you're working 50 miles from where you live. Speaking of firefighters, John Gilstrap was one. I was, and um, we went through. I was a volunteer at a department that ran 14,000 calls a year, um, and it was a very robust volunteer system when the paid system was was pushed on actually yeah. so there's a lot of pushback from the volunteer system it, are we seeing that in west virginia i don't think we're seeing that here in the eastern panhandle as much i don't think there's a pushback between the two i think i think we, we went through that about 10 12 I years think ago we went through that already uh we do have a nice blend the issue we're having is you know we've got two people manning uh, it comes seven o'clock we don't have the response time we don't have 
That's okay. People it's going to take them 15 minutes to get to my house anyway. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so <laughs> the it, two guys it, are all you It's need. something we need to address. Yeah. It, it's something we need to move to. And, and while there's uh, lots of differences throughout the state, I think most people can see the writing on the wall in, in that. I, I don't think there's any specific legislation that uh, I've seen that is coming up. I know uh, there's some stuff that we're working on in the Eastern Panhandle Caucus to, to try and help that, that out. So, Jimmy, any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, on the on the fire department topic, I think one of the biggest things, and like like Mike said, there's no specific uh, legislation right now, but one of the biggest things we can do to help them is just help find ways to keep funding them uh, to fund, you know, the, the testing. That's the biggest thing that when I talk to firemen and women, that, that, that it was just it was very costly. Is you know, you got to test the hoses, you got to test the ladders, you got to test the engines. And you got to find people to to come in and do it, and it can be costly and you know time consuming because you have a volunteer fire department that you know, their 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 volunteers work, and then you got the people who test them who, who try to keep a nine to five schedule too. So it's, it's kind of hard to find that time where someone can be there to let them in and let them test and and everything. And it just uh, we need to find ways that we can better fund that. We can make it easier on them for the testing and just get it to where they're not having to do fundraisers to fund the department because that, that I feel like that can turn some members away who want to be firefighters, genuinely help the community, but they don't have any interest in doing the steak fries, the fundraisers, and stuff like that. They just want to help when the help when the siren goes off. Jimmy, thanks so much. We appreciate you being on the show today. And thanks for the last yeah, thanks. minute uh, answering the phone call, Jimmy. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thanks he for won't do that I'm again. <laughs> and watch yeah, out for I'm have to listen in. For one of those Mike Height tantrums, <laughs> tantrums and yelling, I want to see that sometime. I hear that sometimes. Look, and somebody needs to say this: Utes, the Utes, Utes. Two Utes. Utes. Yes. So, What's we, a we, Ute? We, we, uh, that just went. Right oh yeah, yeah. I'm just good. feeding a dialogue. Yeah, yeah, that went over your head. This will too. Watch out for two guys in a mint green Pontiac Tempest. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Jimmy Willis uh, from the uh, third delegate district at 9:33. Yes. Richard Roundtree passed away yesterday at the age of. Uh, 81, he was Shaft. This is the theme from Shaft with Isaac Hayes, one of the more iconical TV show themes ever. It was a movie with Richard Roundtree, and a very popular movie, too. They remade it later on. In studio with Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, and the mogul, Delegate Mike Hornby. I promised you your own half-hour segment. Here you are, big guy. You asked me in. You bumped me last week because Hardy called in for 20 minutes ranting. <laughs> I wouldn't say that was bumping. It was, it was definitely bumping. I wouldn't say it was bumping. like, hey, we'll give you three minutes at the end of the show to say hi. <laughs> it was, it's, it was he went of, with the interesting guy. Yeah, he went with, with the better radio, and I get it. I get Nonsense. it. Nonsense. And I, did, I didn't ask. I, I, he asked me to be on, so. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, well, the subject matter that you created with your first guest yeah. last week Spilled over into the second half of an hour. Well, I think it's nice. The to, Freedom Caucus. I think it's nice to bring on these other delegates from all around the state because I get to know them personally, right? So I, I know them over. We basically lived together for two, two and a half months, essentially. Um, so to get the perspective of why, who, what, you know, we, we live in very different parts um, geographically and, and economically. Um, so I, I love to have these guys on so they can kind of explain what the body is thinking and Mm -hmm. you know i might not agree with jeff foster on everything but i i do respect them and we get along it's not like we hate each other but he is you know has his beliefs and i have mine but well i don't want to uh miss out on time with you today because uh (laughs) you are the boss so we saw the editorial that hoppy wrote regarding sat scores in the state Mm -hmm. which are the lowest in the country yes right and as a member of the education committee, it's your job to try to fix education in the state. You guys took a massive step with that, with the third grade uh, um, K-, K through three um, and I think this, legislation the, you passed. I think this, the, the whole story needs to start about 10 years ago. I think it was 10 years ago they passed the uh, the pre-K, where, where we had free pre-K for all West Virginians. And I think we're starting to see the results now. If Colin's got the slide, he can throw it up for the pre-K. We are leading the nation. We're in the top 10 in scores in our pre-K. Um, if you go back to the first one, um, Colin, where it says plus eight, um, you can see that the, the numbers. We are now reaping the rewards of our 
installation of pre-K. My daughter went to pre-K, my son did. Um, and we, we saw the, the grades fall off in first, second, and third, and we've addressed that with the teacher's aides thing. So I think we are on the right move. And if you look at that line there, that's COVID. Um, and when you look at those results and, and the uptick that we've had based on the, these graphs, and this was uh, a presentation that was given us to, in, in the interim, uh, and I thought that was stunning, that we're actually doing really well in pre-K, and then it kind of drops off first, second, and third. Um, but I think with this AIDS program, we are going to start reaping the rewards because, as you know, the third if you can get them to read and, and do math by third grade, the su success rate is, is unbelievable. Most of these AIDS, I, as I understand it, are being deployed in kindergarten right now. Is that correct? I think that's right, yeah. I think they're starting with kindergarten, and then they'll, they'll bump it up as, as, as they get funding. All right. Now, how, how long will this program be funded, Dwight? Um, I believe this is this is something that we are going to install for the future. Like, this is going to be something that we're not just – it's not a test pilot program. This is something that we are budgeting on and working on, and we will find the funds to, to fund this for the future, especially if it's, if it's successful. How does – I don't – you're not in the Freedom Caucus, but does the Freedom Caucus have an opinion on this bill in one way or another? Um, I don't think so. I don't think they uh, they came out against or for. I mean, Bill Bill was in uh, Bill Ridenour, I believe, is in the Freedom Caucus. I think he's in education with me. He didn't have uh, any major issues that I that I can remember anyway. Mm -hmm. um, it passed overwhelmingly um, on both sides. So I think most legislatures know that we need to we need to bring up our test scores. That's the only way we can hold education education department accountable that's the only way we can tell um graduation rates are still at 98 percent yet only 37 percent of high schoolers are, are proficient in math there's a we're just graduating a, for the purpose of graduating right now there is and i think yeah. that's why we did this discipline bill last year so we can give teachers the power to hold kids back not the administration um and i think that's where the cutoff is or the disconnect is too but how do we get the kids to school? You know, that's that. We that need to hold. We need to hold parents accountable. You're going to criminalize? I'm sorry. I got. I got to stay home it's and a, lose my paycheck. So that it, it's already criminalized. It is criminalized. Not truancy. But but, but it's not enforced as much as it maybe should be. Well, and as a practical matter, if if for whatever reason, if we assume we take out the percentage of parents who just don't agree with school and they're going to let their kids be free range, I'm going to I, I, I pray that that's a small number. And then you have the parents who are launching their kids to go to school. Bye, honey. Have a good day. And the kid just doesn't show up. And then there are the ones that can't get to school to begin with because mom and dad either they're working an early shift and can't drive them or, you know, I've, I've, I hear all of these stories. But if they're, kids they're can't stories, get to school. They're, they're excuses. I mean, oh, they, absolutely. It, but we, we need to get past the excuses. And I think, you know, we, we had a, a presentation in the interim committee on discipline and, and, uh, uh, Suspensions, in-school suspensions versus out-of-school suspensions, how many kids are um, pushed through and how many of those f are generally failing. And, and obviously, the more suspensions you have, the less well you do in school. Uh, we have a giant success rate in the Challenge Mountaineer Challenge Academy in, in West Virginia where they've take, taken challenged kids and they've turned them around, and they are succeeding fantastically. That's something we should be looking into across the state. Yeah, what Maybe does we, challenge mean? The Mountaineer Challenge Academy is a, a basically a, it's almost a military school um, for those kids that – It has structure and discipline. It has structure okay. and discipline, and, and it's working. So maybe we should be investing in multiple Mountaineer Challenge Academies and holding kids accountable that are – have discipline issues or truancy issues or hold parents accountable that don't care if their kids go to, go to school. Could that be a possible charter school environment? I, I don't see why not. I mean, there's multiple options. Just when you look at the... But it's a boarding school. It, does it is a boarding school. Boarding Absolutely. School? Yes. Uh, and, and I grew up uh, in a very distant, different system. We had a British school system. So, yeah, we had boarding schools back then, and it was usually the... You know, they did very well, but... It, it's working in West Virginia. It does work. And, it's and, a great school. Um, maybe that's the answer for some of our discipline problems and our, our education problems. And I don't think that as a whole is going to help test scores or anything like that. But does it's well, an option. 
so the, the Mountaineer Challenge Academy, how's that structured? How's that like looked so, at by the law? Is it a is it part of a? Well, I, I believe how it started. We funded them to start with um, with some seed money, and then it, it's totally voluntary. I mean, the, the kids go there, but it's a public school. It is funded by a. It's, it's funded Preston by Preston County. I think it's down. Yeah, down in it's, Preston County. It's either Preston or Mon County. Yeah, I, I know personally a couple of kids from Berkeley County that have gone there and can't come out completely changed. Yeah, I mean, just fantastic human beings, and they weren't before. Have we considered making high school non-mandatory past? You know, like after. 14 because it seems to me that there are kids who really want to go to school and they want to learn and there are kids who really really don't and then there are some in the middle <clears throat> but the ones who really don't want to be there tend to be disruptors yep. which really take education away from the kids who do want to be there uh, i i would say all options on the table i think we don't expel enough kids and i know we're supposed to give an education to think but as you say if, if somebody is continuously disrupting or continuously getting suspended or continuously doing the, these bad behaviors we need to hold kids accountable well and an out of school suspension is like the kids dream right yeah so they get to sit home do yeah. whatever they want i mean it, and that's what they're going we should be able to let kids go you know what and i know we had this uh system where, where i grew up you know about 15 16 you could go get a, a job and you didn't have to finish school um, and there are there are people that are just not into schooling, but would rather go. And many get, become get very successful. They I got, a, get into a, I trade. got a friend who dropped out at fourteen. He's now a diesel mechanic, uh, working for Caterpillar, travels around the world, making money, working on giant trucks because he's the only one who's willing to get his, his hands dirty, and mm -hmm. he, he's been doing it for twenty five years, making great money, making great money. Uh, I think we need to promote trade schools more too. Um, there's nothing wrong with working on electric lines. I mean, you look at the Blue Ridge uh, CTC. Uh, we should be prom promoting that. I think. That's uh, what my father. The did. Department of Higher Education is. If you look across the state, the, the, our our universities are declining in um, ad, ad, administ, uh, Admission, enrollment. Enrollment. Yeah. enrollment. Yeah. yeah. So, I think kids have realized. Hey, you know what? I don't want to be one hundred forty thousand dollars in debt sitting in school for four years, partying it up at, at WVU or Marshall. Do and we have I, do we have robust ROTC? We, I think, across the state, our ROTC is fantastic. I think yeah. Berkeley County, especially the, the Air, Air Guard uh, ROTC, is fantastic. Well, they do a great S job. Same for Jefferson; they have yeah. a really nice one. Okay. Matter of fact, uh, George Morris, uh, Jason Morris, uh, he. he goes by both names uh, he is uh, one of the folks that runs ROTC in Jefferson County he's gonna be on the show coming up early on in November with some so, of those cadets so John this is interesting but truancy has a, a possible penalty of you can make the parent attend school with the child you are a prosecutor and you have your staff how many of those <laughs> cases have you actually pursued sending the you? parent to the child no, no no just in general treating truancy as as a crime does it happen often yeah, I yeah. Mean, I, well, it, I mean, we have a truancy. We officer. have a truancy yeah. officer. Yeah. 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 So as, as as many times as they charge it, and I, and yeah, I wasn't prepared to talk about this. I right. don't know the numbers, but but I can tell you, schools don't like it when you've sentenced the parent to school. <laughs> it's more of a harsh. It's harder on the school than it is the parent generally. And that brings me to the next topic: is you know this uh, uh, WV Zoom WV. It, it's the Department of Education and the agency put together this uh, this website where you can really delve into your school, your your county, and look at the numbers of disciplinary actions that have been taken, how many times you know kids have been suspended, what the test scores are in every grade level, um, and when when you can let the public in on that, it's just a fantastic tool. I think to, to and there are people that hate it, but um, it, it really lets you delve into everything that a school does, including their finances. What's the next layer to the cake, Mike, in fixing the state's education issues? I think we just got to keep working. I mean, we got to keep working. I think uh, uh, Delegate uh, Elegant Ellington's our chair. They, they really are. We're trying to address. Uh, I think, obviously, the uh, Hope Scholarship. I think we need to take some of the restrictions off that. Um, that's the next step. I think there'll be legislation in the upcoming session to give more uh, freedom to people that are in private school or in, uh, in, in, you know. How much access do you have to all the information involved in education with the state as a member of the Education Committee? 
I think we have a lot of access. Um, we have to ask the right questions. The the state bo BOE is kind of shielded sometimes. They, they like to blame the, the, the counties for stuff when the counties blame the state. Um, I still believe, you know, they're appointed. To, the actual BOE is appointed. I don't like that. But um, I think we have a lot of access, and we have access to lawyers that can get us um, the information we need. Right. Um, I will push back a little bit on our local um, superintendent and, and thing. I have met with them a number of times. Uh, they have given me that. Uh, they have brought issues to my attention. Uh, I have tried to fix those issues or bring solutions to them, but um, the response has not been great, and I'll, I'll be addressing that next time I speak to them. So with, with the access that you have, 